So Robin Davidson, as, as Ashley said, wrote the word, uh, well, the word, and the book called Tracks. <laughs> it was a very long word, 2,700 <laughs> kilometres, um, which is going to be a film very soon. We're going to be talking about all of that, but as Ashley was saying, um, we're here in conjunction with the Anne Lander Award, the, the Video Art Award that Angelica Masiti won, won. Yes, she did. She did. Yeah, yeah. No surprises there, really, for you? I'm very glad that she won. Um, I was very moved by that work, and I don't usually... Uh, I was talked into uh, writing about it by Anna Schwartz, and it was at Anna's house that I saw the work. And I was so moved by it that it was easy to talk me into doing it, and it seemed to um, relate so much to my own concerns. In, in what way? How did they relate? It doesn't sound like you were talked into it in... It was a very hard thing to talk no, you into it. No, it wasn't a hard okay, thing. Good. It was, it was a hard, because I'm trying not to write at the moment anything, um, uh, it was hard in that sense. But no, I thought it was a wonderful work. Um, and I would say a very intellectual work. Um, beautiful, of course, and moving, but there, it had a, a clarity of purpose that I really responded to. Hmm. And I think it can be read on all sorts of levels, that work. You can see it as nostalgic, or you can see it as um, hopeful, you can see it as tragic, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's a very um, moving and important work. I, I mm. was completely stunned when I watched it. I was mm. I sort of, you know, sometimes I go to video works and I think, and mm. I hate to say it, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. You, you mm. go in there and you think, oh, I'll just watch a minute of this, and if mm. it's any good, I'll, I'll, I'll stay, mm. or, or not. Mm. And sometimes you only give it a few seconds. Mm. But I went in there not knowing what to say and I was completely mesmerised. Mm. And, I, and I love the... And you talk about it in your essay, about the formality of the way it's shot. Yes. Why does, why does that connect with you? Um, well, I thought it was so respectful. The camera was so respectful. It was very still, very respectful. It gave the other artist the space to perform and to do what they do. Um, and that gave them a particular quality, both a both um, a sadness, but also, a, 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 yes, I, I say respect, a deep respect. Mm. Mm. Can, I, can I quote you from your essay? Sure. I've done my research, <laughs> all right. You say in your essay that mm. when we leave our place of origin, what mm. can be let go of and what can be kept? And can, we keep what, can, we, can what we keep belong to the new place as well? Mm. In discussion of the works in, in that video, mm. I wonder if you can throw that back one on yourself, in, in, particularly in, in comparison to, to what you experienced or chose to do when you first landed on that train station in Alice Springs in, in was it 1977? 77. So long ago, I barely remember. In fact, when I... <laughs> Thank God you wrote I, it down. <laughs> well, when I, the funny thing about memory is that now when I go back to remember that time, I very much remember it in the context of tracks, not so much the event. Really? Yeah. So you remember it in terms of the book? Yeah. And it's almost like the book... I know this is off the question, but it's almost like the artefact, the book, took the memory and uh, kind of enclosed it so that now the memory is encased in the book and not in reality. It's a very peculiar thing. And now that the film is about to be made, the film is yet another abstraction from what on earth happened out there. You know, <laughs> It's almost like it happened to somebody else. And whatever that journey was, it's now been so abstracted by, by these artifacts that it hardly belongs to me anymore. And yet, do you feel in any way that you own that experience? Yes and no. I mean, yes, of course. Um, but, but I think with each abstraction, it does belong to other people. And of course, reading a book is, is an imaginative act. Seeing a film is an imaginative act. The film has very, actually, it's a lovely film. I'm very pleased with it. And I adore Mia Wasikowska, who's playing me. But really, it is their version of that story and has really quite, you know, very little to do with me, mm. really. And the version that you did was mm. two years after you'd completed that journey, yeah. journey yourself. You're in a, mm. in a flat mm. somewhere, mm. some small mm. space, and, and remembering everything that you'd gone through as mm. well, creating a new version of that, as you say. Well, exactly. Mm. And it is an artefact. And I, I remember that 
what happened in that, so it was two years after the event and I was in London in a horrible pokey little flat um, and I swear that I remembered every campsite of that entire nine month journey. It was as clear as a bell, everything clear and memorable. And then as soon as the book was finished, it was, I sort of forgot the journey. <laughs> <laughs> and you took no notes along the way? Not at all, no. Okay, good, I believe Well, you. I had no intention of writing a book. It was, um, I hadn't intended to do that. It what, t what turned you to doing that? I mean, I obviously, I know mean, this is 30 years later, this mm. book has been translated. It, it, is a, it is a book about Australia. It is a book of our time in, in mm. so many ways, mm. so mm. important. But do you remember that moment when you thought, I'm going to write this down? Do you know, I think, well, memory is tricky, but I think my reasoning at the time, mm. I, I was asked to do the book by a publisher in London, by Jonathan Cape in London. And because there'd been such a lot of publicity anyway that I hadn't been expecting, I thought that if I wrote this book, it would be a bit like throwing a bone to the dogs and they would focus on the bone and leave me alone. And, <laughs> and I thought if, if there was this thing called Tracks the Book, then I could get on with my life without being associated with that journey forever and ever and ever. But hey, that didn't work. <laughs> 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 the publicity at the time, I mean, because mm. you're getting a lot of publicity now, yes. which, which is good, mm. but you hated it, didn't you? You absolutely despised it. Yes, I did. It. Look, I, I don't despise it now. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite equanimous Quick, take about photos. it. Hmm? You don't despise it now. No, I don't know. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I did at the time. I didn't despise it. That's the wrong word. But I found it extremely uncomfortable because it seemed to me that it took away from the authenticity of what I had done. So it was simply that. And that, so it became sort of other persons, other people's fantasies about what the trip might have been rather than my very own. And, um, but in retrospect, I see that that's what happens to all our lives. You know, it's always a, um, our lives are a, a kind of construction, really. Mm. Mm. But there was something at the time about you, a young woman of what you were, you were 27 years old, mm. undertaking such a major journey. Mm. Even today, I could, I, I don't know how many women would, or men would undertake such, such a massive mm. um, project. Was there something about that moment that caused... That era? Yeah, that era. Oh, absolutely. I don't think you can understand the journey outside of the context of its era. It was the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and... You know, quite a few of you here I see probably remember that era. And um, I think it was a time when people, when young people particularly were pushing boundaries and being very experimental, um, very political in their um, desire to th throw away or experiment with the roles that had been handed to them, and particularly for women, of course. Um, so I certainly was fueled by that time. Um, but what's interesting to me is that the book seem, you know, the book's got legs. People are reading it still and finding something in it. So, so it's not entirely about the 70s. I think there is some kind of mythical center in that book that, mm. that people respond to still. Well, I've only read it recently mm. and I, I mean, I put myself into your shoes and mm. I wonder whether or not I could do what you do could I endure what you went through? Mm. Could I put up with Kurt, the <laughs> slightly awful Austrian mm. whom you had to deal with? Mm. That, that I think maybe that's what it is. We suddenly, mm. because through your writing, we suddenly can empathise very much mm. with what's going on. Mm. How did you endure Kurt? Does any, do, have, who's read the book here? Okay. Uh -huh. Everybody put your hands up anyway. <laughs> there's a character Kurt, called Kurt. That, yes, there's a, a mad Austrian. Um, so the, the gist of the thing is that I went to Alice Springs to try and find some camels to take me through the desert. And um, naively, I had thought that would be fairly easy. I'd just find myself some wild camels in the bush and train them and off I'd go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it wasn't quite that easy. So there was one camel man in town called Kurt Pozell, and he was truly one of the most deranged human beings I've ever known. Um, <laughs> But he was a genius with the camels, and he did a deal with me that I would come and work with him for a year 
and in exchange he would provide me with two of his camels. And of course, you know, um, one hardly need say that the deal fell through. Um, but, well, I suppose the answer to the question is that because I wanted to do this thing, um, and because being with Kurt, even though it was hellish in so many ways, I was learning a hell of a lot about those animals, how to train them. It was never boring. Believe me, it was never boring. So he would, for example, do things like put me on a, one of his young camels um, in training and I would gallop bareback down a creek. Now, for a young girl of 23 or 24, that was kind of, you know, made up for a lot of other stuff. Um, so, yes, it was partly that it was interesting to me and partly that I thought the end of it would further the, you know, further the, the idea. Mm. But to have the idea at the start and then mm. to maintain that idea through mm. Kurt and many mm. other trials, mm. including mm. some serious sexism and, yes. and, and, as I could imagine, in, you know, in the mid-1970s, mm. and to still have that goal towards the end, how come... Tell me a bit about the idea of perseverance, this concept of being mm. able to endure regardless mm. and see mm. the end in sight. Yes. I think it's called stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still stubborn? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> um, look, I... You know, having said that, it's also true that the way I think I've probably done difficult things is that I just leap in the deep end and then try and swim. Um, and, of course, there were times when, quite a lot of times, when I thought, well, um, this is all too hard and I want to go back. But somehow the idea of going back was worse than keeping going, I think. That's, uh, you know, the possibility of failure or of um, going back on one's tracks. Um, so, yes, it was sort of... And, and also there were... I think the other thing to say is that I didn't ever let myself think that I would eventually cross the desert. That was much too big a thing. It was, that was an idea far off in the distance and if I just sort of kept going and never, had to think, never have to think about that, then at any point I could pull out and retreat. Um, so those are sort of tricks that, you, that one has for keeping going, I guess. Mm. But you see, I never... I don't, I don't really think of it now in terms of huge endurance. It was more, that seems to me slightly negative. Whereas it seemed to me that this was a positive striving towards something um, and an overcoming of something. And in fact, when the journey was both proceeding and when it was completed, it seemed to me a thing of joy rather than a thing of endurance, if that makes sense. Mm. So, so the endurance was part of the joy. So all the difficulties were part of the joy. Mm. So in, in context, I mean, we're sitting in an art gallery yeah. here where endurance yeah. work is, mm. a, is a type of work. It is a type of work, and yes. And we, we can see some examples of this in the, in the Anne Lander exhibition. Yeah. Um, one of the artists, uh, Kate Mitchell, apparently mm. carried a 70 kilogram man from Bondi to the city, mm. which would take a while. Yep. and would be quite heavy. Yep. That's a form of endurance work as well. Tilda Swinton, I think, is at mm. the moment sleeping in a gallery. Sleeping in a glass cage somewhere. <laughs> we could do that. Do you, look, I, look, do you, see, your, do you look, see any connection I, I, with those sorts of performative ideas? Not really, although I respond to them when I, when I see them. I can sort of understand them and, and respond to them with some deep part of myself, but... The, as I say, the actual journey and all of those things that I did seemed to me much more positive. The idea that I could equate it with carrying a 70 kilo man somewhere, mm, no. <laughs> Even though there were very heavy saddles to lift and of course it was physically uh, difficult, um, it didn't seem in any way punitive, I suppose that's the thing. Mm. Yeah. W was the endurance dealing with the press at the time and the attention that you ended up having to deal with Yes, there was that. I mean, of course, there were things along the way that were very hard to deal with. Um, you know, there's a, a point at which I, I think, became quite crazy in the head when, 
the trip became particularly difficult and I didn't know what I was doing it for and so on. Um, so yes, there were those moments that, and they did require a kind of stubbornness or, a stubbornness or endurance. But as I say, in the whole thing, if I think of it as an artwork at all, I think of it as a joyous event, hmm. a joyous artwork. Um, it might be great to hear some of your questions as well. So if you have any questions, to, please do put up your hand. I know Robin would love to hear um, some of your thoughts and your mm. questions too. So mm. throw your hands up. There's a roving microphone um, going around. Mm. But in the moment, um, mm. whilst we're waiting, the mm. photographs from National Geographic yes. are gorgeous. But I know at the time, there's, here, they're in the middle of the book here, there's these Im amazing, and th these form part of the journey that you read in, in, in tracks as well. Mm, but mm. I know at the time, you, when you first saw them, you were pretty upset. What was wrong with seeing those pictures? How did it change your view of what you were doing? Yes. Um, well, there's a backstory to this, which is that I had never wanted the journey to be recorded. It wasn't important to me at, at all. Um, my reasons for doing it were personal and um, I didn't think anyone would be particularly interested. But at one point in the preparations, I simply needed money. I didn't have any. I'd been working as a waitress to try and save money to get the equipment that I needed and I didn't have it. Um, so I wrote to National Geographic magazine um, and they did decide to sponsor me. And I remember it was for something like $4,000. And I got the letter and the first response was, oh, hey, you know, I, can do, I can go. And the second response was this, um, that I realised I had sold the trip, really, for $4,000. Um, in any case, what it meant was that, A, I would have to record the thing and therefore I would have to think about myself doing the trip. Um, and secondly, there would have to be um, a photographer involved um, and he came out on the journey maybe I think four times altogether to record it photographically and um, he was a lovely young Jewish boy and he fell in love with the camel lady and so it was a bit of a burden to me to take to, to have to deal with him. Um, anyway, and the camels and the desert and the flies and the heat. All that, yeah, that was easy. Cold and <laughs> <laughs> that was relatively easy. Um, but he showed me the first lot of photos when we met up at Ayers Rock. And I was totally gobsmacked by these pictures because he'd made me look like a Vogue model. Um, you know, lots of backlighting and blonde and... Uh, and I think that was the first intimation that I had that that this, that, that something that I was doing for s from such a subjective, f through subjective agency, was, was inevitably going to be objectified. And so it has been. And of course, you know, now I look at the photos and think, God, they're beautiful photos. <laughs> but then I just saw them as another objectification or this taking away from the performative act. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also, you're quite beautiful now. Do you look at yourself just rather than that, just go, oh. Well, I, you know, Sounds like all young people, I know this, it seemed, <laughs> I know. We didn't, we, I certainly didn't think I was beautiful. I certainly did not. Um, but I think all young people have that flaw, don't they? Mm. Oh, no, we all think we're gorgeous, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? The question is, why did I do it? I've been trying to answer that question for about 30 years and... Really, I don't think it has an answer because the answer is either so complicated that one can't possibly um, ex uh, explain it. Um, you know, why do we do anything? I, co I, could, I could give simple answers like um, I wanted to be on my own to, you know, see if I could be. I was very interested in Aboriginal culture I love the idea of the desert and being in the desert. Um, I'm sure I thought of it as some sort of self-proving. But, well, the camels were cheap, you know, the most practical form of transport. It's simply that. They were practical. Mm. And I couldn't afford a jeep. <laughs>
Thank you. Maybe the flip side of that question is why, rather than why did you do it, mm. what stops us from yes, undertaking I, 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 these I agree. journeys? I absolutely agree. And, you know, the flippant answer is why on earth would I not want to do such a wonderful thing? It's transformed my life. It was, I saw things that were so beautiful. I learned so much about the world and about myself. Why don't we do these sorts of things more often? And what constrains us and what, you know, limits the ideas that we have for ourselves, particularly women, but of course everybody. Mm. But to take risks, to, to do mm. things like this, particularly mm. in, in this era today, sure in 1977 mm. or when mm. you, you first started, it was, mm. it was a different time. Mm. And, I, and I, I can res mm. respect the fact that perhaps the open country might have been mm. a lot more, well not easy to traverse, but you mm. could actually go straight through. But I couldn't go and do this today, could I? It would be a very different event. Um, it's almost impossible now to get lost. You know? Yeah, we're, co we're constantly watched, We're not allowed we? to get lost. We're not allowed <laughs> to get lost. Um, and it seems to me that's a great loss in the way that we think um, about the world. Um, we, we, I think, more and more agree to be controlled, we agree to be watched, we agree to be safe, we agree to not push it, not ask questions, not push boundaries. and. Um, and it, I suppose it does make for a safer world, but I don't think safety is everything. Hmm. And we're too accepting of it, aren't we? Yes, definitely, mm. definitely. We've, so mm. we've given up a lot. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I, I've you. got lo so many more questions, but I know it's it's time to wrap up. I, I'm looking forward very much to seeing the film. Um, the book again is called Tracks, and I, I must say it is a real honour to meet you and to speak with you, Robin Davidson. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.